look back right at the like architecture right that we're doing um it's the idea that i mean so far what we really have is like our laptop let me make this bigger okay so our laptop is hitting an api um and then we're gonna upload the data essentially as a csv file to s3 and then we want athena to be able to query S3. Remember, like it has this input bucket and then Athena directly stores the results in an output bucket, all right? And then eventually what we'll move into is, you know, moving, I think it will come in a, like a later lab, but we'll have to move this itself to a Lambda function, right? And we'll want this maybe to be triggered by this thing called like an event scheduler. And what that would do is just like every minute send an event saying, hey, hit the Lambda function, all right? And then the Lambda function will hit the API, uh, store the data in S3, and then uh, once we see this S3, uh, we'll have a trigger. Once we see the upload to S3, we'll have a trigger to query with Athena. I have this whole thing that we're doing. It's actually... So this is where we, this is where the, the last lab left off, right? That we will take our laptop, upload the CSV file, right? We'll make a request to an API, upload the CSV file. That will trigger a Lambda function, which then queries S3, uh, right? Queries S3 and sends the output over here. Okay, so this is like what the lab is leading up to. And then what will come after that is this even more, I guess, complicated, which is we'll basically repeatedly send an event to hit our API, right? And then upload the data test three, which will have Athena query that data uh, and then uh, send the, out, the results to an output bucket. Okay, so this is what we're leading up to, but where we are right now is here. Okay. So what we're where we are now is essentially like we just want to be able to have Athena uh, like set up Athena so that we can query our bucket, you know. And we have this service called Glue, uh, which Glue essentially like manages or it like stores the metadata right of our bucket and allows us to treat a bucket as a table. And I think like the idea behind this. Um, is, you know, we can have all these different buckets, you know, S3.1, you know, like we can have like maybe our Texas data here for managing like our receipts. And maybe there's, we run some sort of restaurant app. And we also have other information in like Foursquare, of like Square, Foursquare data. And, and maybe this is in a different S3 bucket. So the problem is, you know, if you just have all these different buckets, uh, like scattered around AWS, they're not organized anywhere. So what we want to do is we want to start treating this like a database. And, in, and to do that, we have this thing called an AWS data lake, right? And then we have glue. So these buckets will like essentially live in this data lake that gives us a database, right? We were able to, we'll see this in a second. We're able to like create a database. Let's call this our restaurant database. And then glue can crawl these buckets and essentially allow us to treat them as tables. Okay. So we're taking our S3, like these random S3 buckets and just imposing a degree of structure on them. One by organizing them in terms of like a database, right? And then two by, okay, like taking these CSV files and being able to, you know, to uh, have some information about like the columns uh, and data types associated with those columns. Right. So that's, that's what this service and this data lake service that's closely related to it is going to do. Oh, so Jeff, yeah, I have a question on that one. Um, so for Athena, like it basically, it knows the tables like only through glue, right? So through the crawler, mm -hmm. like, so yeah, we, we, we saw like the glue crawler, like you can, you can set it recrawl like by demand and or like a, have a certain like schedule, right? Time schedule. Right. Yeah, the, 
the issue like yeah, yeah we're thinking like how how it knows when you upload the CSV file like how it can know that file exists like and and uh, and Athena can query from that like I, yeah that's the part that I'm not sure. Um, so it 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 only knows the file exists by when crawling from uh crawling that the bucket. All right. So like you said, either you'll have to crawl the bucket um, on demand, right, by like clicking that button that we'll see, or, uh, you know, also we could set it up on an hourly basis. So when you say, okay, crawl this bucket, it looks inside, right, you specify, do you want it to see like the subfolders and the files, and right, it will look through those files, see the structure of the data inside them, and then create a table from there. Yeah, yeah, so, so how, how, how can you make an automation like when you upload the CSV file to S3? Oh, then, I don't think that's you know. automated. It, it, that part's not triggered. What's what's going to be triggered is the query. Is, so there's two different things. One is essentially like creating the table. That's done automatically. The other thing that's done on a trigger uh, is the query. Now, can you set up glue to when you upload a file, kind of recreate the table? Pro I don't know, probably, right? We'd have to look at the Bado library. That's what I would guess is, you know, look at the Bado library, see if we can, you know, kind of recrawl a bucket from uh, using Bado uh, and, and do it that way. Yeah, right. so, so, so my, my basic, basic question is like, without recrawling, like a thing I don't know anything, like if there's a new updates in S3. Like it it if, does, it, it, it knows, uh, th well, it's more Lambda. So what's going to happen is the, the, the real thing is when we upload a file to the bucket, that will trigger a Lambda function, which says, hey, run this query. Oh. Does that make sense? OK, yeah. yeah. Okay. So this, you know, and we'll see that, like, right, like, like you were really, uh, this sends an event. We can have an uh, like an object create on a, in an S3 bucket, basically uploading a file to an S3 bucket. We can have that send an event that then uh, gets sent to our Lambda function and says, run this function, run Lambda, and Lambda will call our Athena, which will then query the bucket. What right will query the bucket? In general, uh, when should we use these event streaming strategies versus a REST API? Like REST APIs that talk to each other? Um, well, this is this is like event. I, I'm not quite sure I understand. Can you give me an example? Like, so here we have Lambda functions that oh, they I get understand, yeah. right? Versus the REST APIs that you showed us before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, okay, hey, so here we're using like, you know, a Lambda function uh, that is serverless. I think it's more about like the fact that, hey, this is, you know, serverless, right? Whereas with like the EC2 instance, um, you know, the other way that we saw this was, you know, doing something like this, right? Uh, where we have an EC2 instance that hits the API and then stores data in our database. So the question is, okay, when should we use like the EC2 instance? And then when should we use something like Lambda? I think ultimately probably come, there's a couple things. It Part of me wants to say it mainly comes down to cost, right? Like, like here you pay per transaction and then here you're paying, um, uh, he, here you're paying, you know, for this thing to always be running. And I, I don't know. I, I would probably need to research this more to see, like, you know, what, like, when are there are the good use cases. But like, this this has some problems because one, you have to determine like how to scale this up. Uh, meaning, like, if more people kind of use this service, then you'll have to specify, hey, I want you know to allocate two machines to this instead of just one. This will automatically scale for you. Uh, so then the question is. Okay, when is it beneficial to actually just use this? It could be that um, at a certain point, this pay per transaction gets too expensive. But I don't know. Like I'd have to, I probably have to Google that some more, right? And see. Okay, but that's a good, a really good question. Obviously, like the difference between this 
EC2 instance where we're always paying for use um, and this thing is always running versus you know this serverless idea. One other limitation to this, this you can only store so much code and so much like remember like we'll have to store an entire environment on this meaning like any Python libraries etc um, on this serverless Compute like it's really an EC2 instance, but AWS only gives you so much memory, so much uh, hard drive that you're able to access. So the max on this, I think as of now, is if you use dot, it is 10 gigs under certain circumstances. So like if you go above that, right? Like I just don't think you can, or I don't know that you can store more than like 10 gigs of say libraries like pandas, numpy, uh, the request library, things like that that you might need. Uh, in a Lambda, whereas here, right, you can always store more, okay? So you might run into limitations in terms of like the actual environment, like a coding environment, right? Here, we, we don't really have a limitation. We can just always plug more hard drive into it. Here you do, and right, remember, it. I, I think it charges, I know it charges based on memory and time. Um, it may charge based on the storage as well, I'm not sure. Right, so, so to a certain extent, it might come down to cost, and to another extent, it might come down to just like environment limitations. Why would we use uh, like uh, Airflow, like get the data from uh, S3, mm -hmm. transform it in the, uh, that's a free of cost? Well, it's not free, right? Because that Airflow has to be running. So we're, we're going to learn it. We haven't learned about Airflow yet, but... There's another, this is one scheduler, right? Which is, okay, we're, we'll like have this event scheduler, send events, uh, make a request, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's another option, which is to use Airflow. Um, and we'll learn about Airflow, but Airflow is another kind of scheduler, right? Which will, which similarly, we can say like, hey, call this API, et cetera. Now, is this free? Not really, right? Because this scheduler has to be running somewhere. So what do you do? You deploy it generally to an EC2 machine, okay? I, I think this might be confusing for people that haven't seen Airflow, but the point is, like imagine if we're gonna host something that's gonna wait until the correct hour to call something. We need to, that code needs to live somewhere and that kind of scheduler also needs to live somewhere. So we'd have to deploy this to an EC2 machine, and then we'd be back to this, like, the meter's always running type of thing. Now people, you know, we, people do this, right? Like, like but, but this is, this is a trade-off. Mm -hmm. So th that is a benefit of this, right? Like of a Lambda function is, hey, like, cool. We are not paying for this thing to always be running. Right, we are just paying for it to essentially, you know, in this moment, you know, use our code and you know do whatever, right? Like we only pay, like I said, like per the transaction, per uh, the lambda function being called. Cool. All right, let's. So what have we talked about so far? Um, we went, we got into this idea, right, of this like data lake, right? Remember, right? This idea that hey, like we can store unstructured data. Um, I actually put like a little like reading uh, from AWS on like a data lake. And it, but the idea is, okay, we can store unstructured data, meaning like, uh, like we can see, like we're not really doing too much with this data that we get back from the API. We're just converting it to a CSV. We're not really transforming it too much. Say you have like log data, right? Like, oh, the user went to this location and, you know, went made this request and this request and then, oh, we broke this stuff, right? We're generating tons of log data, but we might want to uh, query it to see, like, what URLs broke, et cetera. We can store that, right, in our data lake. So the idea is, hey, we get this low-cost storage, um, but the, the downside, because we're just storing in an S3 bucket, but the downside is, uh, well, it can be unstructured. So the attempt of AWS is to say, let's create this uh, data lake kind of service where we can store these different buckets or associate these buckets with a database, right? And this is just a folder. It's not really a database. It's just a folder. It's just a naming convention. And say, okay, in that database are, you know, a couple different tables, 
right? Where really these tables are S3 buckets. So it's just for you, the developer, to have some order and organization around our data lake, okay? You might hear the phrase like data swamp, right? Because things just become so unorganized. Um, so this is that, that's the goal here. All right, let's, let's move into uh, creating a bucket. And feel free to ask questions along the way. So far, these have been really good questions. So we'll have like Texas, uh, do I have it? Query lecture. Okay, so that's our new bucket. I'm not really doing anything else with it. We're still blocking all public access. Uh, and we'll just do create bucket. Okay. So we, you can see that bucket here, right? And there's nothing inside. So then the next thing we can do, uh, if we follow along with this, is we'll basically, we'll use our code on our computer to hit the API and then store this in S3. So we can do that now. So I think I have it here. Okay, so this is in the, the we, we like wrote some of this code, first of all. But secondly, uh, this is, this is in like the Athena reading, I believe. So like, let's, let's understand this. So what goes on here? So we have our query bucket name. This is where we're going to want to upload our data to. Let's change this. We'll call this Texas Query Lecture, right? We could have created the bucket here, you know, but I just, we just name it. And then we're going to call this function request and download locally, passing through the restaurant name. What do you think this function does? Right, it requests, so it makes a, a request to the API, and then we'll save a file down here. So we can delete this because this function should do this. All right, and then finally, we'll read the file that will be over here to our bucket. All right, so we can start to see that. Right, it calls us find receipts. Find receipts hits the API. Uh, then we save the data, right? We turn it into a CSV and we just return it, return the data. Um, and then finally we upload, call upload and read, upload and read reads the file name and uploads it to the bucket. So we're gonna store the data here and then we're gonna upload it to our bucket. So let's call that now. Um, you can see I was doing it before class. And then we'll do, so we'll do Python 3 dash I upload. Oh, sorry, it's in a extract load slash upload console. Okay, let's do it interactive. And it will, it will run this, right? So what we should see the new file come over here. So it's hitting our API, it's writing the file, and then it's upload reading this file and uploading it to our query bucket. Uh, so we should see that here now. So here you can see the CSV file uploaded, right? And the other thing I did was in this request upload and read function. You can see after we upload the file, then we get the file and then we just read it and spit out the text. So if I look at this, this upload and read should return to me the text that's in the bucket, right? In that file we just uploaded. So this is what we just uploaded to our bucket. All right, so all we did so far was we basically just called this code, this code requests, hits our API, downloads a file over here, takes that file and reads it up to uh, S3. What's next? Sorry, so if we go over here, right? So we just did this part, we uploaded our data to S3. What's next is basically to set up glue so that we don't, so we have like this data lake kind of idea, right? So we can crawl our bucket and then uh, query it with Athena. So let's do that next. Let's go to glue. Let me do this again. You can click on crawlers and I'll do create. I'll just start again. Let's go to glue. All right, and then we can click on crawlers and then we'll do create crawler. Okay, we just enter a crawler name, uh, lecture Texas. It doesn't, the name doesn't. And we need to add a data source. So one issue uh, we saw, I saw was just like when adding the data source, this should be the bucket. We just want to upload the bucket itself. Uh, and then we'll, you know, and the bucket will represent a table. So whatever you put here, that's going to represent a single table. So in this case, again, it will be like our bucket. 
And that's also going to be the name of your table. So for us, it was Texas Query Lecture. So just find bucket, Texas Query Lecture. We'll click on this. The other thing you want is we need the slash. And this will say, okay, read the files inside of the bucket, right? So this is the bucket itself. This is going to be our table name. Ultimately, is going to be Texas Query Lecture. Uh, so we could have chosen, you know, maybe we should have chosen a different name. But that's all right. And we'll crawl all the subfolders. That looks pretty good. And then we'll finally do add an S3 data source. So now we have this as our data source. Uh, this seems fine. This is right the service glue that's going to access S3. So because sorry, because glue is going to access S3, we need to create permissions for it to do that. So let's do that now. So that's this next step is create a new IAM role. So we'll call this, you know, glue. I, I, I would just call it Texas glue. And this is the default role. So we can view this. If we click on view, we'll see what AWS thought we should have. Uh, and you can start to see this is what the these are different policies, but this is the one that is most relevant. So you can see what it does is it allows you both to get an object and put an object. And it's reading from our data source, right? Texas Query Lecture, all the objects inside of it. Right? So th this is what's these are the permissions for Glue to access our S3 resource. All right, so we did this. Let's go to the next thing. And that's this choose a database. So this really comes from that data lake uh, service. So if we, you know, if you look at data lake or lake formation, AWS lake formation service. So you can see these are all the databases like we've created so far. And inside these databases are various like tables. Okay, so what we'll do we can just create another database by clicking add a database. Let's just do database name, database lecture Texas, create a database. I, I should have done something better like restaurants. Let's just do something else. Let's do rest restaurants. Okay, so this will be like in our restaurants database. And then let's choose a database. We can refresh it here, refresh the list here. And now here's my restaurants database. And then finally, right, so it's my restaurants database. We already set up the data source. We gave permission of the crawler to that data source. And now we said we are setting a schedule, which is just going to be on demand. And then finally, we can create the crawler. And then this just creates the, you know, the tool, our little, little crawler thing. Next, we need to actually use it. So that's this run crawler button. And this will take, you know, 15 seconds or so. So, so far, we're still here, you know, so we uploaded some data to S3 and now we're just setting up glue to be able to access, uh, to be able to crawl and like create the tables uh, for S3. And that will kind of like give us this structure, right? And then finally we'll use Athena to actually perform the query to our table. And this is really Texas query lecture. Okay, so let's go back uh, to here. So it's still crawling. Let me refresh, see if we're any better. Whoa, it's taking longer than I thought. So the next thing, while we just wait for this, let's go over to Athena. That's the next kind of tool. And let's hope that this thing works. So what we need to do here is, again, it's like, this is essentially like Postgres, right? We need to connect to the correct data, database and then in that database, query a specific table. So for the database, that was this restaurants thing. I might have to refresh this. Here it is, here's restaurants. And then look, here's the table inside. So this seems like this was crawled at this point. Let's go back and make sure, so, right? So this says completed now, one table change, right? Um, and you can see here's the table and here's the various columns. And now we can just crawl this. So we're connected to the database 
and our, our table name is Texas Query Lecture, we can also just see it right here, right? And then call run, right? And here we see our rows, okay? So, so a lot of the work here wasn't really in Athena. It was really in having Glue create our tables. And remember the point of using something like uh, Athena is unlike with our RDS instance, this is always running and we're paying for a CPU to be able to be listening for requests, right? And as we have more storage, we'll need like more resources and we'll and probably the CPUs generally scale up with the storage with something like RDS. In this case, we don't have that, right? With this like kind of data lake where we might want to have a bunch of buckets, right? We're not really paying too much money to store this data and then we just pay per query, okay? So this is separating out compute, right? The cost of performing the query from the cost of the storage, okay? So as our storage increases, we don't really have to scale out our CPU. We can just still say, I only need to query this bucket right now and only need to do it once. Um, all right, so, so that's what we're getting here. Okay, so the next thing, where are we? We are, we've hit our API, we've uploaded some data to S3, and then we've had Athena query this. The next thing is just to use Athena from Bado. Uh, so you can imagine that like, we have this other code that what this does is connects uh, Bado to Athena, and now this is going to query instead of you know this will actually really what this does is this asks Athena to query our bucket, and then that remember we have our input bucket, and then we have the data is directly stored in our output bucket. So that's what this is showing, right? That's what this whole diagram shows. Bado, we have Bado upload data to S3, um, and then for right now we'll just use a our laptop code right, our laptop, which will query Athena and send the results to an output bucket. So the way that we can do that is going over to, I think this console.py file is fine. Um, so we have to specify our output bucket's name. For me, I think this is still fine. Uh, the database name, this is what we're querying, right? You can see, you know, when you're reading code, it's good just to see, like, where are these variables used? That oh, didn't do it. So, you know, we can just highlight it. And you can see this is this DB name. This is going to be used to say, how, how are we querying Athena? This is the query itself. This query is really passed through here. So this is going to be select all from, and this is our table name, right? So this we need to change to our input bucket. So that's going to be, um, not that. Let's close this down. This. Select all from Texas Query Lecture. This is the database name, right? And then this is still the output bucket folder. And then finally, we get the query results from the output bucket folder. Uh, and we have to use this query response thing because it's that's all we really get back when you query Athena is you get back a query response ID and you use that query response ID to find the results in the bucket. So anyway, let's use this. I, I think that's, that's all the configuration we need. So I'll exit out of here. We'll run this again. And we'll run our console.py file. And now we'll do uh, query results, select all from Texas Query Lecture, limit three. And let's just remember that's this thing, right? That's our new table. And it breaks. OK. Um, why? When calling query did not finish, query state failed. It could be permissions is generally what it is. That's my guess. Because uh, when it's even calling the get query results, it's not doing this properly. I'm not probably going to be able to bug, debug this too well. It could also be this, maybe the Jigsaw Texas results. I'm, I'm just trying to see, like, is that required? when we query it, and it is, right? So it could be in here from there. Um, then we call get query results. 
so it broke even before it got here, I believe, right? If we look at Query Athena, we're taking the database name, we're starting the query, and then we are specifying right where the output is. Aren't you using the restaurant's database? Is that the one? Oh, thank you, Ken. I think you're right. Okay, database name is not Texas Receipts, is it? It's called restaurants. Let's see if that did it. Right, because I was, you know, my thought in, uh, initially went to permissions, but it doesn't really make sense because if you, what you want to think about it right now is like, what permissions does Bado have? And Bado, remember, this is set up by that slash dot AWS file, the credentials file in there. And for me, that should be, should be admin permissions. So it probably is this. So I'll have to exit out of this. And if it's not, I'm kind of out of ideas. Right, and this is my Texas Query Lecture. This is the name of the table in this database. That's feeling better. There we go. All right, gang. Thanks, thanks, Ken. All right, so this retrieved our data. What's the next kind of, so we, you know, I always like to make sure things are working in our laptop first uh, before moving over to Lambda. So then what's the next step? So the next thing we wanna do is we want to have it so that when we upload something to CSV, remember we can call like our Bado from laptop. Uh, like we can, in other words, we can call this, this extract and load code, right? So we can imagine calling this thing, right? Which is gonna make the request, upload a file to our S3 bucket. And then what we wanna do is set a trigger so that when something gets uploaded to our S3 bucket, this triggers Athena, sorry, triggers our Lambda function to then do something, probably query that file, okay? Query what we uploaded or query our bucket. So let's create a Lambda function. Uh, let's go back to AWS. Because we haven't, we have not created a Lambda function yet, right, so far. So we'll create a function. Uh, let's call this my restaurants uh, lambda. The runtime will be Python 3.9. I think that's the most recent we get. Yeah. This architecture, right? Generally, you'll see this later when we like integrate Docker with this. Um, is that we? You want this to match. You're going to want this ultimately to match your machine, your local laptop. Uh, I have ARM64. I mean, right now it doesn't really matter, but when you get to Docker, it will. So if you have a Mac M1 or M2, you want to choose the ARM64. Otherwise, this is fine. Anyway, it doesn't matter now, but later with Docker, it will. And then we can click Create Function. I think we're fine. So this is pro I don't know, I guess it's creating or allocating some of like an EC2 machine is why I was taking a minute uh, to give us some space to add some code. All right, so remember this, uh, this is just like part of a, we get an environment effectively to execute a function and we pay per use. And you can test this thing, right? This is gonna be, we always have this function, right? Lambda handler. You can change this name, but by default, that's what it's called. It takes an event, right? Like an event, like for instance, uploading a file to S3 and this context, which just has some like metadata, right? Like when was it called? When was the function called? Things like that. I generally, this stuff is not, let me just see like print time in Python. It's like the logging is not uh, so great. So I like to oftentimes just like print the current time I guess this works fine. Import date time, date time now, and you can just print now. That works fine. So I'll put that in my Lambda function. And then we'll just import date time. So we'll just do from date time, import date time, and then here we'll just do date time done now. Okay, so now if you test this thing, uh, this will print out the current time and like return some data just to, we can create a new action here, right? This is our test event. This is effectively what will get sent to uh, in this argument here. 
we're not really using it. And then we can just uh, call this sample event and then click save. And then, oh, we should deploy our changes, right? We actually wanna, it's like pushing to GitHub, right? We wanna deploy our changes. And then we should be able to just click test. And this is showing you the result, right? Um, test event name, response, it's, it didn't print it, I, or probably did, it's just not showing me it the best. In order to see the results, oftentimes you wanna, you can click on monitor and then view CloudWatch logs. CloudWatch is another AWS service just for logging, right? Like logging, uh, uh, like actions performed in your AWS code base. So here, here's the time, all right? That's the time that we are printing out. And notice you don't see the return value in the log. So that's why oftentimes like I want to print out the time or something so I can identify that this thing occurred. Okay, what's next? So we just tried out our Lambda function. Let's set it up so that, let's add a trigger, right? So that when we upload something to S3, it will get called. So let's go back to, oops. Here we are, restaurants Lambda, click on add trigger, select the source, we'll do S3, right? And now we want to, you know, we don't want to listen to any file getting uploaded to any bucket, but like our specific bucket. So that's this Texas query lecture, so we can type that in. Texas query lecture, S3, I think that's fine. And now all object create events. That default is perfect for us. Every time we upload something to S3, then we'll uh, do that. Okay, this thing is actually like a very good warning. It says, do not use the same S3 bucket for input and output. Uh, I'll explain that in a second. Let's, let's go through here. So we just created this trigger uh, I don't think this will work yet because we still need to give our Lambda function permission to like have access, right, to be able to detect when objects are created. So to do that, we'll need to add a permission. All right, so you can, you know, you can click on this. Under configuration, you can see, hey, we are listening for the correct thing, and it says we're listening for event types of object created. So that part is all good. Now let's go to permissions, uh, and here, let me see, not there, here. This is where you can see, right, this is the role associated with uh, my Lambda function. A role is just like a user. The only difference is you can't log in, like the same way I can give a user permissions to do certain things, I can give a role permission to do certain things. Roles are meant for services though, because you know, with a user, we get to log in with a username and password. With a role, there's no, you're not logging in. Like our Lambda function is not logging in, right? So there's no username and password. But this thing still gets permissions. So let's click on it, and we can see the permissions associated with it. Currently, it, what does it have? It basically has the ability to create the log stream events, right? That's the put log stream. So it can create a new log stream, right, which is like, uh, right, which is those the files themselves, and it can also oh, let's go to view CloudWatch logs. So it can create a new like log file effectively, right? Create a new log stream. It can also create a new log stream event, right? Like actually write to the file, but not much more. So let's give it some additional permissions. We can do that. Uh, we can, we, there's a couple ways. One, we can just create a new policy uh, by clicking add permissions and create an inline policy. Uh, or we can edit this thing to give it access to S3. I'm gonna have to look this up, by the way. Uh, this is under triggering Lambda. Like the permissions always, right, they're just very detailed. We have to get the details right, I should say. Okay, so this is really all we need. <laughs> it wasn't that hard. But this is a statement uh, inside our policy, right? So we want to say allow, and this is saying any of our S3 bucket, that's fine for me. You know, we'll allow, give it access. It's not listening for any S3 bucket, but it has access to the, to, to read uh, an object from any S3 bucket, right? And we can, so to start off, oftentimes, I'll also just make this like a little overbroad, and then you can always narrow the permissions down. So, 
here we have the statement of create log group. We have this other statement of create log stream. Uh, we have the resource. This is the end of this statement. And then finally put a comma and then paste in allow get object. So this is another statement allowing me to read from S3. And let's click next. And then I'll do save changes. And now that's, you can see this, right? I can read and I can write to the logs. Okay. And now what's next? What's next is we can uh, delete this file. We can basically want to test out our trigger. So we'll delete the file and then we'll upload it and see does this thing actually get called. Okay. So, and you know what else we can do? Let's print out the event. So let's go to code and we'll print out the event. So print now a function called at. And then we'll also print the event and we'll click deploy. And now what's next? Uh, now we want to see does this trigger work? So we'll, like I said, we'll delete this. Say permanently delete, delete the objects. And then we want to, yeah, let's remove this Honduras thing. And then we can do this extract and load, right? So that's this thing in abstract and load extract and load if we call this upload and read that should upload to our s3 bucket which triggers a lambda which uh, does the rest python 3 uh dash i extract load upload console.py there you can see we have the file uh and we have this uploaded text. So that was uploaded. We can probably see if I refresh. We Oh my god. Okay. Oh, there it is. We have an object here. And then we want to go to my lambda function and look essentially at the only evidence is to look at this monitor tab and then go to CloudWatch logs and see what time is this? 114 Eastern. So also you can see there's a second log stream. So sometimes it's a little hard to see like where, you know, you might have to determine which log stream it's in. So it's in the most recent one. I broke something, which is a bummer, but it did get called, right? We can see it got called. Um, print function called at syntax error, invalid syntax lambda function line five. What did I mess up? No. Someone knows. A colon, uh, Outside of the string? Uh, oh, thank you. Oh, that is correct. Okay, excellent. So this is, you know, you can see, like last time you'll see that I put this code locally too. You know, you can, it's a lot easier to test it locally. Let's click deploy. So we'll save the changes. Let's make sure we're just printing the event. Uh, let's do this one more time. We'll just delete this file and then try again. Um, delete. permanently delete delete objects call it again okay so that should give me this file back there's the file let's check the log stream uh let's go to log groups Oh, bummer. That wasn't so much fun. So you can see I've logged streams from like all my other services too. It's I guess it's easiest if I just go here to monitor and then go to view cloud watch logs. It'll take me directly to the ones I care about. All right. And then here it is at a different time. We call this. Okay, this worked. Right. So the function called at this time. And then you can see this is the event that we're printing out. So if you wanted to like say use like what object was uploaded, which was just uploaded, right? It gives you that information about what triggered the Lambda function, right? So here you can see, you know, this, this was the file that was triggered in this bucket, okay? The bucket, or sorry, yeah, th that's the ARN, and then this is the name, okay? So what we did here just to review is called this 
from our laptop, which hit our API, uploaded a file to our bucket. And we had a trigger on our Lambda function, which then ran effectively. Um, and to do this, we just not only had to set up the trigger, right, by clicking on add trigger, but we also had to then go to configuration, click on the role, right, and add, update the policy. So that now we have the ability to read from the S3 bucket that we're uploading data to, okay? So I can like actually see that data and you can see how it uses that, right? Like in the event information that, uh, not there. Right, that, that it was, you know, we had all that information about the object and et cetera, et cetera. The next, the next thing, which I think I'll probably let you all do is then taking the code, right? What we want to do, so we just kind of, we triggered this thing. Uh, but what we want to do is like when we trigger this, have it actually not just run something random, but really run, well, actually like this code, okay? So to do that, there's a couple things. One is we're going to need to create another, actually, we're not going to need to create another Lambda function. We're just going to need to take that data, take the code and move it here, right? But we need it to be wrapped in this Lambda handler thing. All right, so we'll, you should probably call this thing Lambda Handler. And remember, it takes two arguments, which is the event and the context. So now we're no longer uh, passing the data, passing the query through, through the uh, argument, but rather we are having the query. We can just hard code the query. It's fine. Okay. So basically, it's going to be okay when you call, when we upload a file. Let's query Athena. The other thing is this return value cannot be a data frame, okay? Because if you like think about it, it's, you know, before what were we returning? We're returning like something in a dictionary. So this is like JSON effectively, right? Or it needs to be JSON serializable. So you can't just return a data frame. What you can do is take this data frame into two dict records, right? And now I'll return a list of dictionaries and that's okay. So we'll need to basically copy this and move that here. I still like having the date time. So we'll just, let's just move that code. So we have from query bucket, we're gonna have to fix that in a second. Call this lamp, right? And we basically when someone uploads, we're gonna now call the Lambda handler. The Lambda handler is going to query the bucket, uh, which then gets get back the results and return them or whatever, okay? And we could like, you know, you could print this, uh, call this records. Let's just print, you know, records, the first couple records and return them, something like that, just so you can see. Now, we're gonna need to create this folder so you can uh, file, nope, I think here, new folder. And this is called uh, Athena. Eh. We could create a folder called Query Bucket. Let's just call it, create a new file called Athena Bottom. It doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. Let's delete this. Athena Bado .py. So from Athena Bado .py, import our code, namely import this query Athena function and get query results function. So I have to put that in there. Um, so, oh, yeah, I'm putting the wrong thing. So let's copy that. And I think this is everything. I don't know. Some of this stuff is, I am copying over the wrong, like this is, okay. So th what I'm, you know, sighing and moaning about is like that this thing is, it's just like you have to be careful about how many libraries you're really using because we're gonna, this, our environment does not have pandas in it. Like our Lambda function for free does not get the pandas library in our environment. Uh, 
this IO, I guess it does have, I think, but pandas, it does not. So it's going to break here. Uh, the other thing it's going to break. So there in the, in the lab, it talks about how to do this. It's actually not so bad. What we'll need to do is let's click deploy just to upload this. What we need to do, I think is under configuration there. I guess I'm wrong. Maybe it's under code. I think it's under code. If you scroll down under code, there's this thing called layers. All right. So what we'll need to do is add something to our environment such that we have pandas installed. And the easiest way to do that is to choose an AWS layer. And that will give us this one is probably what I want. Eh, or this one. This is fine. So you can see, what is this? The AWS Software Developer Kit and Pandas for Python 3.9, right? So this will have it, and then you just want to choose the most recent layer. And I don't think I've, I don't know that I've chosen this one in the past. I think I might have done this one. Eh, maybe I did. Sorry, I can't remember. I also don't know what the difference is between them. So anyway, we want to choose this layer. That way we can have Pandas installed in our environment. And now notice when you do that, you get this layers one. Okay, so we're adding a new layer, right? And we have that in there. Um, okay, what's left? So then what's left is effectively setting up the permissions. And so I'm gonna have to go back to configuration permissions and add the role and you know either create a new policy by you know create an inline policy or you know update this thing so that it has permission what does it need permission for it's going to need permission to use athena right like athena is our database and we're and so far what we've done is we've used athena from bado which is fine because our bado has admin uh policy right has admin permissions but now we're going to use it from lambda and so our lambda needs to be able to access athena and it also needs to be able to access glue because i think i'm not sure exactly probably because that's where it gets the metadata about like what the table information is in our bucket so to do this in the lab i'm not sure i'll do this successfully by the way but i'm on a roll so we'll just keep going uh so here I know I, I okay that's where we add the layer and now here's the permissions okay so you can see what I'm effectively allowing for is allowing basically all actions on Athena again we can you can always make these permissions more restrictive but I like to just get it working so this probably is a little bit too broad but I'm allowing all actions on Athena from really any resource beautiful and here I'm at least more restrictive with S3. We already have S3, uh, but we don't have all actions on it. All we have currently is just read actions. We don't have write, and we're gonna need write actions because remember, Athena is going to write our results, right? The query results in a different bucket. And then finally, look, here's the glue as well. This you need, I know that from experience, that we need to say, you know, give permissions on glue as well. And then we, this we already have, I think. We already have these put log events. So well, we can, let's just create, add all this, and then we'll, this is, our pol this is a full policy, right? We can add this to, uh, okay, here's my Lambda execution role. I think this is the role associated with my Lambda function, right? Restaurants. Lambda role. Let's just click on it to make sure. And restaurants Lambda role. So just add, do create an inline policy and choose a service. No, I don't want that. I want JSON. Sorry. So we'll just so we'll really kind of create the JSON for me, but I have it here. Um, we do not need, so this is the policy we were just talking about, right? Allows all actions on Athena. It allows all actions as three actions on this we're going to need to you're going to need to update right because it's not it's going to have to match your s3 bucket both the input bucket and the output bucket so let's just make sure we do that here 
So this is the input bucket is Texas Query Lecture. Uh, so the resource, this is the this is what I will need to change. Texas Query Lecture, Texas Query Lecture. That's fine. My output bucket is called this, but you will need to change yours, right? Because it's going to be writing to this, uh, to that. The rest of these are fine. I don't need this, I don't think, because I already have this permission. But I'm just going to keep it, and we'll see if it breaks. So I'll do review policy. And now look, uh, oh, and I have to create the policy. So this just creates a policy. So I'll call this lecture S3 Athena policy. And so and, and then what I'll probably need to do is attach, is it attached? Oh, there it is. I thought I might have to attach this policy to the role, but it is already attached. Okay. Well, I don't know. Let's see if this thing works. Uh, the easiest way for me to do that, like I'm skeptical that this will work because there's a lot going on, but the easiest way is uh, just to create a test event and run this thing and see what breaks. So let's do that. Okay, name, date, time is not defined. That's that's an easy one. Uh, and that's in lambda function.py. So that would be here, import date time. Oh, and it should be really from date time, import date time. You can see again, like this is why it's probably preferable to have as much as possible in locally. Uh, oh, and then I need to deploy my changes. Because you make mistakes here and then the, the feedback loop is not as good. Oh, that was amazing. All right, so this worked, guys. Uh, I was not expecting that. Um, yeah, so this is nice. So what happened? So I ran the test event, and it queried Athena. And then it printed out these results. And look, it even says the word succeeded. Uh, so OK, that's nice. And other things that you may run into, just so you, in case you do, it could take too long. Like, like they only give you a certain number of seconds. I think the default is three seconds. In the lab, it talks to you, it, it mentions how to change that so that you can give yourself more time and more resources. I just don't know. It might be under general. Oh, here it is, general configuration. You see that after three seconds, it's gonna time out. And with something with Athena, Right, those queries take a, at least like a second or two. So you may have to edit this if you get like a timeout error. And you can just increase this, all right? Uh, the last thing that we wanna do is just call it from here and watch the little dominoes fall. Uh, and so again, we will remove this from the S3 bucket, we're almost done. Uh, permanently delete. Delete the objects. Successfully deleted. Go through here. And then, right, it's deleted. And now we'll upload the, hit our API, upload uh, this thing, and then that will trigger our S3 and the Athena call that comes with it, I think. Uh, and it's 1.30, so let's just see Right, so we should be able to see that under monitor. Oh, look, yeah, let's go to monitor. Sometimes it also takes a minute for these logs, for you to actually read it in the logs. See this, this is, this is not most recent. It might be in this log, I'm not sure, or I might have to wait a second. Right, this is from 128. Did I break it? Import name. See, this is an earlier one. Uh, I don't know. Let's two click, click on a view cloud watch logs. Maybe maybe it has it more updated. Log streams. One twenty nine. It might be written to this one. Okay, so this is my test event, and then this is, and then down here. This is 130. 
right? So this was the event getting printed out and then us querying Athena. So this happened just to review one last time because we called this, that uploaded a file to S3, that triggered our Lambda, which then queried Athena and sent the results to an output bucket and we read those results and printed them out here. All right, I'm done. Uh, questions, sorry, questions. I'm happy, like any questions about any of this stuff. I definitely go through the lab and, and feel comfortable about this. Kind of so, is your code available somewhere? Yeah, I mean, this that code, if you go to the lab, like, I mean, is it this lab, Lambda Athena lab? So if you click on source, and then you look at query bucket. Uh, no. Ooh, do I not have it? No, it, it's probably, it, it's in console. Here, go to console. Right? This is my Lambda handler. Here's the date time printed out, called at. You would have to change, right, the output bucket, the database name, and this thing, the input bucket, right, that you're querying. And then that will query Athena, get query results. Here it just prints the data frame. And remember, we cannot return the data frame itself. We have to convert it to something that's like a list of dictionaries or like JSON. So that's why we call it two dict records. And then here, all I do is I, I just comment out Lambda Handler. So I update, if, if you're looking at the code from last week or whatever, I updated the lab a little bit, uh, like the reading, so it's more clear. Um, but this is, so you can run this function locally and make sure everything works locally. And then you can just copy this. You, you know, not only have to con copy the console.py, but you also have to copy uh, what this depends on, which is this Athena Bado function, query bucket Athena Bado. So that's one thing to know. The other thing that the lab tells you is you can't just create a file called console. Like you can create a file called console, but it's not going to call console.py lambda handler function. Right, because this lambda function, it's specified where, like, what it, this is the entry point, right? The handler, right? And the handler is in the lambda function.py file, right? In the lambda function.py file, not in the console.py file to call a function called lambda handler. So you just have to, you're going to have to make sure these things align, okay, with what the handler is specified as. Otherwise, I think everything's the same. So, uh, so yeah, I have a question. So, so the query, like SQL query, is like the table. It is basically the S three input back name, right? Yes. Yeah, I'm wondering, like, if you, for example, if you upload multiple CSV files in that bucket, like. They, they need to be the same structure to do that, right? Like they'll have to have the same columns essentially. Um, why, why is that? Right. Well, because right, it's trying to, it's like glue is crawling your bucket and looking to see uh, like how to create a table from there. But I don't know if it's going to be able to handle, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but I don't think it's going to be able to handle it if like one file has certain columns and another file has different columns, you know? What you'd have to do is when you have glue set up, you'd have to basically, create, you know, specify the uh, target not as the bucket itself, but just as a specific file, right? Which some of you all did, but that kind of messed things up with the file name, right? Because then that, that becomes your your table name, and I don't think it crawled it properly. So, um, so yeah, like those files should, like whatever collection it is that you're crawling, they should be consistent, right? The data in there should be consistent so that the columns are consistent uh, throughout the, you know, the data. So, so um, yeah, yeah, I'm not, not sure if I understand, understand correctly. So, so to make this like automation works, like basically you need to have that table being crawled before, 
and, and then, then you upload, upload that. that. That's true. But, but that, would, yeah, yeah, that's true. But that will work. Like that's pretty practical, I think, because say for example, like all we need to do, and what we will do is um, just kind of like call this extract and load function, say like once every hour. Or something and we can you can imagine this data would change and so we call our api to get the rate latest like receipts or maybe we do it once a week uh and that will you know but the structure that you know and that will upload a new csv but as long as that csv file is the same structure which we can kind of ensure that it is all right it, like that's not then everything else will work yeah yeah, yeah that, that makes, makes sense. sense yeah, yeah because, because yeah, yeah just, just, just share my experience, experience. Like, like i just, just tried, tried um like, uh, so, so if, if I, I upload, upload a new, like, new CSV file, like, like it's mm -hmm. not part right. the in different, different structure, structure. Yes. then uh, you, uh, Athena, like, like basically, basically cannot recognize that, that, uh, that table. Like, right. Uh, but like if, if I use the folder to crawl that folder, then the like, Athena just recognize. Like, like, really? So what does it do? Does it create, it create, if you, it creates, like, more columns, I guess? Oh, no, it's just a... So, so I, 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 I upload, upload multiple CSV files, files in, in, in that, that bucket, bucket, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the quarter recognizes all those tables, like it will, will, will create separate tables for all the CSV files. files. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Okay, so I guess that does work then. That as long as you, like, I guess you can have uh, files of different columns with, with different structures, and it'll just detect different tables to create out of them. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah but, but the, the automation, automation, like, like the, the automation, automation you use a scene, like, like uh, this one, like uh, with, with Lambda, Lambda yeah. they won't, right, they need to be crawled. Right, right, yeah. right. If, if the structure is changing, right, then it well, needs to be I think you can probably make, make an automation with crawling in the mm -hmm. middle. Yeah. Right, true. Cool. Other questions about uh, what we covered? I'll obviously, you know, upload this lecture. But, uh, you know, I, I think a main thing is, like, going back, and I put the these diagrams in the readings, but just, like, keep track. Like, do your own conceptual work. Don't just go through the motions. You're never going to remember that, and it, it, there's not much to get out of that. Uh, like, kind of try to conceptually keep track of, okay, here's where I am in the process, here's where I have to do the next thing, et cetera. Right? Okay? All right, I'm going to...